Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Deeper. And uh, today it's great to have John Sexton with us. John preached on Sunday uh, in our series, Faithful and Fruitful, uh, particularly looking at being faithful and fruitful when we've messed up. Uh, and John, it's great to have you with us today. It's lovely to be here, Steve. Yeah, fantastic. So um, we're looking at John 21, uh, verses 15 to 22 today. I think it'd be great if we uh, encourage you to read that passage. So why don't you press pause now, read John 21, 15 to 22, and then restart the video when you've read it. Great. I hope you've done that. Uh, John, do you want to just quickly summarise your talk from Sunday? Uh, yeah, the, the scene is that um, Peter and the other disciples have, um, uh, in their failure, have gone uh, back to Galilee and they've been fishing and they've been very unsuccessful. And as they come into land, they see a, a figure on the shore who not only says, cast your net out one more time, which is wonderfully successful, but they also see that he's cooking bread and fish on a little barbecue on the beach. And as the dawn breaks, they all sit down together and have this wonderful time together uh, with Jesus after his resurrection. Uh, but during that time, there's some unfinished business between Peter uh, and between and Jesus. And um, G Peter is asked three times uh, if he loves Jesus by doing this. Uh, and um, his response is each time, yes, yes, he, he really does. Um, uh, and because he trusts that he will be the end of that, the end of that, Peter is restored and re-commissioned, re-energised to go on. And you know, uh, and everyone who reads this will know all the great things that Peter, often in conjunction with John, who was here and witnessed all this, did in the first few chapters together. We lost you for a little second there, John, but I thought we'd be lost you forever, but you came back, which is great. <laughs> so uh, let's just think about the passage. Um, it, it, the whole thing, as you've described, is, I think, a wonderfully evocative story. I, it's, it's one of those stories that when I'm reading it, I can picture in my mind. You know, I can picture the uh, Jesus with the, uh, the, the little fire and the fish. I can imagine them all having breakfast together kind of laughing and joking, especially as you realise who they're with. I can imagine uh, Peter walking with Jesus along the shore of the lake as they have this kind of conversation. Um, it is just an incredibly, uh, what's the other word I'm thinking of? It's a story that you can absolutely imagine, isn't it? You know, you can, it's plays pictures in your mind. It is, and uh, and you don't need. I mean, there are some very good videos on YouTube if you type in uh, "feed my lambs." There's some very good reenactments. But but actually, it's such a vivid story. And the reason I chose this one when you gave me the theme, rather than David or Jonah or one of the many other people who've messed up, was this one stresses far more than any of the others uh, how everything can be put right again. Yeah, it is. It's a fantastic story of restoration. And the thing that strikes me about this is that um, Jesus doesn't ignore the fact that Peter messed up. Because uh -huh. you know, Jesus already had a, a plan for Peter, you know, he'd said, you know, some time before, you know, upon this rock, I will build my church. He already knew what he was going to do, Peter. Um, but he kind of ministers into uh, Peter's failure in such a wonderful way. It's very kind of lovingly done, isn't it? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm props, um, <laughs> uh, if, if something's troubling me with somebody else often I, I prepare just to not mention it very English and just just carry yeah. on and yeah. often I understand from married people that's often the case in marriages what's wrong nothing you know yeah. uh, but Jesus wants this out and dealt with and out of the way doesn't he that's right and yeah I will pick up on that I think in the application but I won't go into it now uh, so then there's this uh, little conversation that goes on is the word Jesus says do you love me and Peter's kind of like responding, you know, but, um, and it, it leaves him feeling kind of hurt almost because of Jesus asked the question three times. But you brought up in your sermon that the fact that um, Jesus uses different words, Peter uses different words for love. What, do, you, do you want to draw that out a little bit? Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm not a scholar, of course, but uh, I understand that we use one word in love for English for everything being... Uh, very keen on chocolate all the way through to a sacrificial love that we would we would do hopefully for God but more commonly for our children if we have children uh, or or uh, for other people uh, and um, and so there is a nuance there and perhaps we shouldn't read too much in it into it um, so just to divert for a second um, I, I did say in my sermon that Jesus calls uh, Peter Simon 
John rather than Peter. And, you know, is this a removal of his title of Peter or not wanting to embarrass him by calling him my rock when he's being weak? But in fact, there are other times in scripture where he's called uh, Peter, Simon, son of John, where there's no uh, disrespect yeah. intended. So uh, I don't, I, this may be the same, not to get it overemphasized. The word that Jesus uses for love when he asks the question the first few times is agape, which is a the highest form of love, the sacrificial sort of love that Jesus has for all of us, the sacrificial love that lays down his life. Uh, props, parent who uh, gives a kidney for a child, but even more so a stranger who gives a kidney for someone they don't even know. Um, for a soldier who sacrifices himself to save his platoon, it's a very high and noble form of love. Peter replies uh, in a much more familiar form of love, phylos, from where we go, the word philanthropy, or uh, it's, it's a love that we might have that's perhaps a, um, not to mock it, but a, perhaps a slightly less sacrificial form of love. Uh, and Jesus answers, uses that in the second question. By the third question, um, he uh, he uses I lost Jesus himself. He replies that almost like to bring himself to the level that Peter is prepared to claim. Maybe Peter's embarrassed to claim that he has shown sacrificial love at a time when he knows he clearly hasn't. Yeah. Although yeah. with the Holy Spirit in him with this recommissioning, uh, you'll know that very shortly afterwards in the very first few chapters of Acts, Peter is quite prepared to die standing up for Jesus. That's right. And uh, I mean, I, I, in my preparation for this, you know, there's, uh, there's quite a few commentators who would say, actually, there's, there's probably no importance in the words. Mm -hmm. But you can't help but think, well, maybe there is, you know, because why would John use different words? You know, why would Jesus say one word for love and Peter reply with another word? Uh, you can't help but think that there's something in that. But it is interesting that John never refers to that. The only thing he refers to is that Peter was hurt because he was asked three times, not because of the and, type of love. That, and and as, you, as you said earlier, that may be the most important point here. That's the yeah. only thing that Jesus, Jesus asked him three times to pick up on the fact that he's been denied three times. Um, that, that may be more important. Of course, if you are a biblical scholar uh, and you're asked to write or 4,000 words on a passage, you will look for everything you can find within yeah. it. Yeah. But having said that, uh, John was Peter's friend. Um, John was also very close to Jesus, the disciple who Jesus felt the most affection for, maybe. And he was there through all these events personally, yards away. So he has thought it worthwhile to mention. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think the, the thing that strikes me is that, you know, Jesus is the good shepherd, the great shepherd is now sharing his work with the person who fails him the most. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think there's there's something significant there for us all in, in terms of how we think about failure, how we think about messing up. Uh, that to Jesus, it's, it doesn't disqualify us. You know, it, it's simply just something that he'll deal with and he'll still cause into his work in the world. But Jesus is not a, is not a member of an interview panel. Uh, you know, sometimes things... You know, yeah. did we make the right appointment there? Uh, you know, Jesus doesn't make bad choices when he called Peter. He knew what he was calling. And in fairness, Peter didn't try to pretend something he wasn't when he says, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinful man. You shouldn't even be near me. Jesus made his choices and trusted in those choices. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the things I read, uh, which which really struck me, is that um, here Jesus is, is kind of, and it's been interpreted by, by some aspects of the church on this, you know, Jesus is calling Peter to lead the church. You know, he's saying, you know, feed my sheep and look after my sheep. Um, but Jesus doesn't actually say that because he, and he, he doesn't give G Peter a title. He doesn't even call him a shepherd. He just says, these are the things that you must do. Uh, and it's not about status or priority or anything like that. He's just calling Peter to serve him and to serve the church. You know, uh -huh. Feed my people, feed my, uh, take care of my sheep. Um, but, well, the church is like nothing more. Historically, they love hierarchical power structures, don't they? We love uh, titles, don't we? We love, uh, we love a good title. In the Middle Ages, it reached the extreme where the heads of the church could order wars and people's deaths and things like this. Uh, and that's not Jesus' way. Jesus' way is, is surrendered leadership. It's he, he who would be first among you must first be servant to everybody. Mm. And that's a very different leadership to the way the world practices leadership. Exactly. And uh, I think it's really interesting, going right back to the beginning of this, where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than these? 
Now, in the passage, it doesn't say who the what or who these are. Uh, how do you interpret that that statement? Well, the um, the commentaries again take several approaches, um, and um, the um, one of them is um, you know he looks around and he, he sees Peter's life. It may not he, you know it may not be exciting, but it's you know he's the he's the owner of a fairly successful fishing business. He he has friends. He has he has he must have a wife somewhere because he's got a mother-in-law uh, and. Um, uh, he has his boats and his nets and this 154 fisher, 10 shekels a time. That's that's a good day's fishing, isn't it? But do you love, do you love me? Are you like, are you like the, uh, like Zacchaeus, are you prepared to, that has nothing compared to following me? Is that what it means? Uh, right. The way I took when I was speaking uh, was the mainstream view in most of the commentaries, which is Peter had bragged that he did love Jesus more than these and therefore has to be particular challenged on that point and that's the first use of the word agape which is why some of the translations say do you truly love mo love me more than these others do yeah yeah uh, not to embarrass peter but just to so that, he, so that he's brought face to face with the claims that he made mm -hmm. yeah what do you think do you think there's another way of looking well at i that? think there's a third way isn't it you know do you love me more than you love the the rest of the gang the oh, other right. disciples you know there's <laughs> a, that way of looking at it because obviously they were with the guys you know uh and you could almost imagine jesus looking back saying do you love me more than these uh, yeah you know and um because in the end peter would be deserted uh -huh. you know he'd be left to die on his own and um and of course jesus alludes to that doesn't he uh later in the passage where um he talks about you know uh your hands will be stretched out, you'll be led where you don't want to go. Um, and he, he says that to allude to how Peter might die. And of course, we know that by the time John writes this gospel, Peter had already been crucified. And, and of course, the story is that he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. So yeah, he, goes it's, from, it's... he goes from being this kind of mess up who, who denied Jesus to this incredibly kind of selfless, brave person who dies for his Lord. Yeah, the um, uh, the complete change in his character after this incident, and of course, after the bats on the Holy Spirit, it, it, it is remarkable. Um, but, but I think it's good that Jesus challenged him. I think that was the last reading that I did in the original passage when, when I was going to cut it off at verse 19, because Jesus seems to want to make this point. And there's a, there's a line in Julius Caesar from Shakespeare that says, the brave can only die once, but the cowards die a thousand times. And Hemingway, <laughs> says, Hemingway says something very similar in one of the Civil War novels that he wrote when he was in Spain. Um, Peter knows what this is going to cost now. Mm. Um, I was going to cut off there, and then I went on to include the bit about John, because it makes that point about, perhaps, as Rob mentioned last week, we are a bit too concerned at looking about the failings of others, how that makes us either feel better than them or makes us feel entitled to be resentful that they've hurt us in some way and don't even acknowledge it. Um, but um, this makes the point that we have to walk our own road. We have to have our own agreement with Jesus to follow him and bear the costs of that, whatever any whatever anyone else is doing. Um, can I share one other insight I had while I was speaking? Yeah, yeah please do. Because, uh, because it was about, you know, um, uh, for those who weren't physically in church, you started with a joke by asking anyone who thought they'd ever slipped up uh, to stick their hands up and you've got you've got a couple of willing volunteers each time but it is hard i think for christians you know who slipped up i suspect there are christians who will admit they've slipped up and those who are sitting there knowing they've slipped up uh, but not being willing to say and I, I think it must be hard for those in positions of leadership um wardens uh, vicars priests to admit they've slipped up in they have off moments, they have off days, they might have off seasons, and they might occasionally do something that is so embarrassing to their ministry, they almost need to step outside it. And yet, we need to allow for the fact that other Christians and ministers and church leaders will get things wrong. And it's not about judging them for it, it's about how to help them back into that position that God has called for each of us to be in, maybe. Exactly. Um, yeah. But it's very, very hard for clergy, and I know most clergy are encouraged to have a special counsellor that they, they unburden to. Yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely true. And I, I think uh, all church leaders can struggle with just being open and honest about their mistakes, you know, because uh, various people like their leaders to be perfect. And, and of course, and we are absolutely not. <laughs> no, and it's... It. So let's think about some of the implications of this. And uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time just going a little bit wider.
So we're going to spend a few moments thinking about what's the applications uh, of this passage that we can take into our lives. Uh, so, John, where would you want to start on that? What, what do you think is important for people to pick up for themselves? Well, there's, uh, there's two things I think immediately to draw out. Many of us have been brought up in church traditions where there's perhaps an unhealthy attitude on our faults. Uh, and that's, as I suppose, <laughs> that's as bad, a, as, as bad a distortion of scripture as to totally say they don't matter at all. You know, the hurt I've done to other people, I I fall from doesn't matter at all. But we can, uh, and perhaps it's a good sign spiritually if we do, that we have got consciences tricked to do something, mm. but we mustn't allow it to hold us, to hold us back from moving forward. How do we put us behind us? Paul had spent his youth murdering and persecuting and encouraging the persecution of the early believers, uh, and, and yet he had to go on and minister these people. And if he just said, oh, well, that was all in the past, it was before I became a Christian, that would have shown a gross uh, lack of empathy for, for, for the impact that it had on, on, on people and their families. Uh, but on the other hand, if he'd let it hold him back, there would never have been a New Testament in exactly. the way that yeah. he did. And of course, um, you know, if, if Peter had been held back by his failure, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have become the, the first church leader. He we wouldn't have the letters of Peter, which are you know key documents in the church. Yeah, um, and and Peter is um, Peter. Peter is keen to have this the story told, isn't he? John is keen. This is an important story to show that uh, um, you you are more than your failings. That, that Jesus sees a different person to the one you see yourself. Yeah, and that's not him. That's not to say you shouldn't deal with the failings. Jesus obviously took them very seriously, but uh, you you have to uh, you have to allow yourself to grow from that. But there's another implication as well. Just thinking about Paul there. How would his ministry have been if everyone he met remembered as the person who killed their friend or had their parents thrown into prison? Sometimes, um, if like the story of the man who was owed a, a little, uh, a massive amount to the king and the king forgave him, and then he went out and beat yeah. up his servant who owed him a few, a few pence. Um, there's a challenge here to then allow other people to move on as well, to help them to move on. Them to grow and sometimes that's initially not to uh, not to not challenge them on where they've slipped up uh, but at the end of the day not to hold that against them either to let them move on yeah. as well yeah. you can not only hold your own sins against yourself you can hold other people's sins against them as well i mean th th this kind of story should at the very least teach us a sense of humility uh -huh. you know in, in terms of how we see ourselves and how we see others and um Sometimes we, we want to focus on the things that we do well and ignore the things that we've not done so well. Uh, Peter had to face all of that. He had to face his own humanity, didn't he? But we, we believe in a gospel that not only puts one person above another in terms of power, we also believe in a gospel that values no one ministry different to any other ministry. Um, and um, people often come up and say, um, you know, I wish I could play, you know, to, to the musicians, I wish I could play as well as you do, uh, or to the speaker, or I wish I could make a point like that, I, I could never, and yet, well, two things, one is sometimes they can, and they can be encouraged into that, mm -hmm. but other times it may just be their gifting somewhere else, a church is made up of a couple of hundred people, all of whom will meet half a dozen people, at least at very minimum in the week ahead, uh, who nobody else is going to meet. That's right. And yeah, I think that, that one of the things that uh, uh, I like about the story is, is the way it honours Peter. You know, uh, so Jesus is having this really deep, profound conversation with Peter that we get to listen in on. Mm -hmm. And Jesus elevates him to a, to a place of ministry from this place of failure. Um, and, you know, we can look at Peter and compare him to others like John, for instance, you know, he's already here comparing himself to John saying, well, what about him behind us? Uh, and John, you know, was, was obviously a deep thinker. You can't read his gospel or his letters without realizing that John was a deep thinker. Um, he could have also, you know, and people did compare Peter to Paul. You know, Paul, a great evangelist, great apostle, traveled all around the place, you know, birthing churches. But all Jesus says to Peter is, don't worry about them. You follow me. You you find your place and serve me to the best of your ability. And um, and on that slightly slightly related subject, the because uh, you mentioned about moving on, the 
uh, you know, everyone, uh, it's easy to find fault in your church. And all around town, you hear people saying what they don't like about their church. But, you know, I look at Christchurch and I see people who five years ago, never mind, weren't in ministry, were in really difficult positions in life. And now they have become, uh, they have grown. They have, yeah. they have allowed that restoration and they're, they're doing all sorts of wonderful stuff that even they wouldn't have seen them doing. And, and I think I'm, I'm in some ways, proud is not the right word, but uh, it gives you a warm glow to feel you're in a church that allows that to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you and your two years here have seen massive changes in some people's lives, haven't you? which has been a privilege to see that and I think that's it's one of the things that we all need to take on board I think in terms of you know, certainly after this story is that failure does not disqualify us from ministry whatever we've done in the past may even be the thing that qualifies us for ministry because we've suddenly learned humility we know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes all those kind of things uh it's kind of really important that we understand that failure doesn't disqualify it didn't disqualify Peter so why should it disqualify you? I think, I can I just bring up something else, John? I'm just yeah. conscious of time here. Um, I think one of the things that struck me is uh, Jesus asked Peter a question, do you love me? And, and Peter responds, to the best of his ability, you know I do love you. But it's really interesting where that love led him. You know, it wasn't into an easy life. And uh, we need to understand that, you know, so within this story, we see two things, you know, Jesus says, well, go, if you love me, well, then go and feed my sheep. So it gives him a task to do. It doesn't leave him in this nice, warm little bubble where he's, it's just him and Jesus and they're having a great time together. Um, no, and perhaps it, it does seem a little unfair that some Christians will have a superficial because you should never judge somebody else's life looking and I've learned that but superficially you hear people think well if I had the kind of life they had my Christian journey would be just yeah. you just can't tell um just about application one thing there you said this story um and this this restoration enables people to move on doesn't it enable them to move on I think massively useful to him as a portfolio as an experience in his future ministry because in those many difficult decades ahead in his ministry when somebody really messed up you know instead of going oh you know, he would say you know what yeah i've done worse i've done worse than you you know timothy or whoever you know yeah. grow from it <laughs> that's yeah, right. I've been there. yeah yeah that's fantastic let's uh, just think about some questions for people to reflect on So here's some questions for you to think about either on your own uh, or if you're in one of our mission communities, a chance to do that together. And it's always important to be able to open up and to share some of these things with each other because that's how we grow by being able to share uh, our ideas, our thoughts, our experience with other people and allow them to speak into that. So let me encourage you, if you're not in a mission community, to, to join one soon. So John, uh, what questions would you like to ask people okay well my first question just a bit of a preamble i know that some of the people watching us online may be just coming to faith uh, and maybe carrying a massive burden they need to talk to somebody to minister about uh, this question is more meant for the bulk of people who are listening are church going christians like myself uh, so that's not to exclude the former type uh, but it's basically if you can remember a time in your life when you were more passionate more faithful more your prayer life was strong achieving more for God. What do you think has changed? Say that last bit again, because the what, sound... What is, sorry, did it jump out for a second? Yeah. What, what has changed in your life to lead you to that new position? How have you slipped props a little back into this rut that Rob was talking about? How have you, how have you messed up from where you were and need to get back yeah. to where you were again? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess, I because I, mean, I was thinking of a similar kind of question. Mine was... Uh, uh, how would you answer Jesus' question, do you love me? Um, and what, why, why would you give that answer? So you might say, you know, I, I'm, I'm passionate and all out for you, or I used to be passionate and I'm not so much now. Um, so yeah, kind of reflect on those questions a little bit. What's your second one, John? Uh, well, it's about when other people have hurt us, because yes, we sometimes too hard on ourselves, but sometimes we're too hard on other people as well. What does reflecting on this patches move in our hearts to tell us how we should respond to someone who's hurt us how do we help get them back to where they need to be as well without 
without creating more rift and more conflict. Mm, that's good. I suppose uh, I've got two questions as well. Um, I think my first one would be, in what area of your life do you need some kind of restoration? Um, and to, to kind of go for a walk with Jesus with that. Um, and I, I mean, what I love in this passage is how lovingly Jesus speaks into Peter's life. I mean, he, he doesn't duck the issues, but you get the feeling it's a kind of tender exchange. Um, so where do you need restoration? Where do you need to be, allow Jesus just to bring you back to where you should be? Uh, my final question is, um, do you compare yourself to other Christians? And is that helping you? Because I guess it's not. But do you? Uh, where do you think that comes from? And what do you think Jesus would say to you in that? So they're my questions. John, it's been an absolute delight having you speak at church and to, uh, to share in this video. Um, thank you for all your service to Christ Church. You've been amazing. Uh, well, I feel like it's been a lot easier now that Dave's taken over as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Andy, of course. Uh, uh, it's a tough time to be in Leeds uh, and yourself now without a curate so um we all as church members pray for each other this week that whatever our slip-ups we um we we raise our game a little if nothing else thank you john so do please join us uh on sunday we'll just be online uh 10 30 uh just uh, do please subscribe to our youtube channel because then you get alerts to uh anything that's going on with uh, with what we do so John, thank you and goodbye to everyone and I'll see you soon. Stay safe. Bye-bye.